Uh, thanks very much. Um, fantastic to be here on the stage, uh, feeling like a rock star. I, I did this hashtag nerds can be rock stars, at least that's the way it sort of feels. It's completely surreal standing here. Um, so I'm grateful for the SMAC organizers for giving me the opportunity. Um, I'm talking today about making trials better. But I don't want you to get the wrong idea about what this talk is about. This is not an anti-research talk at all. So without research, you wouldn't have CT scans, you wouldn't have ultrasound machines, you wouldn't have drugs. And, you know, I don't know if you've got this in your intensive care unit, in my intensive care unit, we've got these beds that basically, like, move the patient around by themselves. And they've got, like, 500 buttons down the side and there was like a half day training session to use the bed. And so now I can't put the bed up or down anymore. Um, that might not be a good example, but, but, but um, nevertheless, I think it's fair to say that the thing that distinguishes uh, the discipline of medicine from osteopathy, homeopathy, and crystal therapy is that we're research and science based. But that said, I think that the predominant paradigm that we have right now for clinical trials is not right. And I think that we can do better than we're doing. So I'm gonna tell you about some concepts that I think are problematic. The first one is power. So power is the probability that you'll demonstrate an effect of the magnitude that you specify in your sample size calculation. The next concept is the p-value of less than 0.05. That's not uh, something that means there's a one in 20 chance that the result is a fluke, all right? Assuming that the null hypothesis is correct, the p-value is the probability of obtaining a result equal to or more extreme than that which was actually observed. Now, it's these concepts that underpin the frequentist statistical approach. So this is how it works. You start off with an experimental hypothesis, you reframe it as a null hypothesis, you get some data, and then you calculate the probability of the observed result under the assumption that the null hypothesis is correct. Now, all of this is very abstract, and it's hard to understand why this is such a problem. Um, but what happens is you apply a threshold p-value. If the p-value is greater than or equal to 0.05, you accept the null hypothesis. If it's less, you reject the null hypothesis in, in favor of the alt alternate. Now, the fundamental problem with this entire paradigm is illustrated by this picture right here. So if I ask you to look at this person and really study them in detail and think to yourself, what are the chances that this person worships Satan? Okay. You have to really look at the details and try and find the clues. Now, whatever chance or probability you came up on with, with in your mind, did you think about the fact that there are only 10,000 Satan worshippers on planet Earth? And if I asked you the same question and I said, what's the chances that the patients are Christian? How heavily do you weight the fact that there are two billion Christians? So this is the problem of base rate neglect. So as human beings, we tend to put too much weight on the specific and not enough weight on the general. So I'm gonna give you another example. This is the example of alcohol and drunk driving. So if I told you that I had a hypothetical test detected 100% of drunk drivers and had a 5% false positive rate. 
I showed Chris Nixon these slides. He told me I could equally have them the other way around. Um, but if there was such a test, and I said to you, we have a driver who's blown a positive test, detects 100% of drunk drivers, and it has a 5% false positive rate, what are the chances that the driver is drunk? Well, it's quite likely for many of you, if you haven't thought about this problem before, that the answer that comes into your head is 95%. The problem with that answer is the same problem. So it neglects the base rate. Let's come up with a scenario. This is probably a bad scenario, but let's just imagine that one in every thousand drivers is drunk. So if one in every thousand drivers is drunk, then of those thousand drivers, there can only possibly be one true positive. That's the drunk driver. From the remaining 999 non-drunk drivers, with a 5% false positive rate, we can expect 49 false positives, right? So under this scenario, there's only a one in 50 chance, if the test is positive, that the driver is drunk. Now, many of you will be familiar with this kind of thinking in relation to the sensitivity and specificity of diagnostic tests, right? From now on, I want you to think of a clinical trial hypothesis, uh, rather, of a clinical trial as a diagnostic test of a trial hypothesis. And so imagine that you're gonna test 100 intensive care interventions in clinical trials. Interventions that might reduce mortality. So you've got 100 things you wanna test and you wanna demonstrate that you can save lives. Now, it obviously depends on what things you're testing and how large the effect size you specify is, but if I were say, to say to you that each one of these boxes in this 10 by 10 grid represents a clinical trial that you're gonna test a hypothesis in, and I were to say to you, what percentage do you expect to be positive? Then the ICU literature is not exactly overrun with interventions that reduce mortality. So let's just say, for the sake of argument, that 10% of hypotheses are correct. So what would it look like under that scenario? So here I've drawn a green box around the top line. These are the true hypotheses. Now, with 90% power, we can expect to, do, to detect nine out of 10 of the true hypotheses. With a p-value threshold of 0.05, under the situation where the null hypothesis is correct, from 5% of the remaining 90 trials, we can expect the p-value to be less than 0.05. These are the false positives. So all of the shaded boxes that you can see on that diagram up there are the situations under which the p-value will be less than 0.05. So what you can see is that if the prior probability that the hypothesis was correct is 10% and the p-value is less than 0.05, then around two-thirds of the time it's a true positive and around one-third of the time it's a false positive. Now, here's another scenario. This is the scenario where 1% of the hypotheses are correct. And if 1% of the hypotheses are correct, then a trial that's statistically significant is five times more likely to be false than it is to be true. Now, from now on, the first thing I want you to do when you read a clinical trial is I want you to go to the sample size calculation part of the paper where they tell you what their hypothesized effect size was, and I want you to think about what you know about medicine, biology, and the world, and I want you to think, what is the percentage chance, based on what I know already, that this hypothesis is correct? There are some effect sizes that are manifestly implausible. Drinking your own piss does not protect you from wild bears, okay? And so, 
if the prior probability that the effect size po is possible is zero, then the posterior probability must also equal zero, no matter what the p-value is. So, if you believe, as I believe, that most ICU trial hypotheses are long shots, then you must also accept that the two most likely results from a clinical trial are no difference and a false positive. So, this is not just a problem for intensive care medicine, this is a problem for all of medicine. So this is a graph showing uh, the rapid upsurge in exciting, uh, exciting findings in medical journals with marginal p-values. So we are facing an epidemic of marginal p-values. And if there's only one thing that you remember from my entire talk, it's that p-values suck, okay? So what we really should be thinking about is probability, particularly when it comes to um, treatments that are currently in clinical practice where there is practice variation. What we actually want to do for such comparative effectiveness situations is be able to have a higher probability of giving the patient the right treatment. The p-value is not important. What is important is that we increase the probability of giving the patient the right treatment. And so wherever there is uncertainty, we should see opportunity. Because if we ever randomize patients, into a clinical trial, there is an opportunity to shift our understanding of the probability. So where there is idiosyncratic practice variation, therapy should be randomized. For the kinds of treatments that I've been talking about, so for comparative effectiveness interventions, where it's not plausible that a single clinician can tell whether treatment A or treatment B is better based on their clinical experience, randomized th treatment is likely to be the best treatment because doctors operating under conditions of uncertainty are subject to cognitive biases that mean that they're likely to make bad choices. So Ronaldo's talked about some of these already. Uh, attribution bias. So the doctor remembers one time they gave one drug to one person who did well, and then they used that drug for the rest of their career. Another bias that they're subject to is novelty bias. So doctors like the newest, uh, most expensive treatment because if it's newer and more expensive, it must be better. And perhaps most pervasive of all, doctors are biased towards doing something when doing nothing might actually be the best choice. And so under such conditions of uncertainty, treatment should be randomized. We should be randomizing patients to treatment A or treatment B. We should be randomizing patients to treatment or control. There are likely to be collateral benefits from doing this. So clinical trials come with uh, protocolized care. They come with additional follow-up that patients would not otherwise receive. Randomized treatment is a good way of hedging one's bets and guarding against the cognitive biases that the doctor brings to the table. Not only that, but if we can come up with a system where we actually learn rapidly from randomizing patients, then being sick today and receiving randomized treatment is the best way to get the right treatment if you're ever sick again. So what we need to do is we need to completely change the paradigm. It needs to no longer be research it needs to be clinical care and a system to optimize treatment that reliably improves outcomes over time. And so the way to do that is to use an alternative approach, the Bayesian approach. Here we have an experimental hypothesis and a null hypothesis. We collect some data. We calculate two probabilities. You can see them on the screen there. The top probability divided by the bottom probability is the Bayes factor. If you take the prior probability that the hypothesis is true, you multiply it by the Bayes factor, 
you get the posterior probability that the hypothesis is true. None of that detail matters, but we need to start by getting big data sources that collect important outcomes for the patients that we look after, and then we need to randomize. Using this kind of Bayesian approach, we can then look at what's happened to the patients and continually update the probability that particular treatments are better. And randomization then can be unequivocally good for patients because what we can do then is we can start off by randomizing patients in a ratio of one to one, and when patients come into the intensive care unit, the aspects of their treatment that are subject to idiosyncratic practice variation, the things like blood pressure targets, oxygen targets, nutrition therapy targets, can be randomized. The information can go into the computer, and then, over time, as it looks like particular treatments are better, we can continue to randomize, but we can weight the coin. So as soon as we have information that makes it look like one treatment might be better than another treatment, even if we don't know for sure, we can increase the probability that the patients will get the treatments that work. If we do this, we create a new paradigm where there is a fusion of quality improvement and science, where every patient contributes information that improves the care of every subsequent patient. It no longer matters what the p-value is, but we can decide if we want to that there's a level at which we will decide that we'll no longer randomize patients anymore, but we'll stop because we've decided that a particular treatment works. Similarly, if we get to a point where we can be very certain that the treatments are the same, then we can declare that the treatments are equivalent, and we can either systematically use the cheapest treatment from that time on, or move on and study something different and allow idiosyncratic practice variation to continue. And so this is a system where instead of having indeterminate clinical trials, where we wonder in the end, was the trial just too small and underpowered, we have results that are statistically robust and they're never indeterminate. And optimizing ICU care is a priority, I think, for global public health, because if you have an acutely reversible illness that's life-threatening, then you come to the intensive care unit. Over the course of a lifetime in a developed country, you have a between one and two and one and three chance, one and three and one and two chance of needing intensive care. And so you want to get the best uh, intensive care therapy that you can. This is a system by which we could save money by not using treatments which are ineffective and save lives by immediately incorporating treatments into standard care that work and increase the probability that patients will get the treatments that work even before we know that they work for sure. This is the way that research should be. Uh, that's my Twitter handle and that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Cheers. Paul, thanks very much. A number of great points about trial design, trial interpretation. Um, your mission was successful and uh, a true science rock star was successful in the mission to make protocols and statistics sexy again. So we've had the most questions, but we are only allowed to have one. And um, so I chose, what about the fragility index? What is your take on that? How useful is it? Should we use it more? Well, I'm biased. <laughs> um, so I wrote a paper on this thing called the fragility index. This is the um, number of events you need to change to make a significant result non-significant. And it turns out that uh, the median fragility index is something like two for major trials in high impact journals. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a useful statistic to, to think about for sure.